matter if you guys are just starting to sell on Amazon or you are an eight-figure seller, uh, the foundation of your business is going to be new business. There's two types of revenue in your business. It's existing products and new products. If you don't go fast and you don't launch a lot of new products every year, your business will struggle on Amazon. You have a life cycle, you have competitors, you have margin compression. It will just continue to drown you and it'll be a swamp that you can't get through. So you have to get very good at finding new products, validating those products, and then launching them at a very high success rate. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to walk through some of the reasons people fail at product selection or why some of the products fail. And then I'm going to walk you through how to understand what to look at at a product to understand whether it's a good product or a bad product. And the problem, we've been uh, doing this ourselves for six years, my wife and I, who's somewhere, maybe she's still hiding in the car. But um, we've been doing our own brands for six years, and we'll do over 25 million just with our brands this year. We launched over 100 products this year already with our brands. And we have a very high success rate. 75% of the products we launch make money. 50% of the products we launch, we reorder and continue to sell. Now, the reason our success rate is so high is because we know what to look for. We look, we let data make the decisions for us. So I'm going to walk you through some of the data that you look at, as well as some of the other factors you look at, which aren't data driven. And the question that I've always gotten since I started teaching our methods four years ago with seller systems was, I understand some things are good and some of the data is good, but some of the things are bad and I don't know if I should still do the product. How good is the good and how bad is the bad? So what we finally did is put together a scoring system to kind of display to you how bad something really is and how good something really is so that you can understand whether you should move forward with a product or not. But let's first talk about the fact that there's no single way to do Amazon or find a product or launch a product on Amazon. There are a lot of gurus, a lot of people teaching, a lot of very successful sellers that have done it many different ways. They look at different things. They don't, might not look at the data at all. They just might go based on their gut or a beautiful design or maybe they, they just add a lot of value to a new niche and they do, they do it from a different way. I'm not that way. I, uh, I'm very data driven. If the data says to do something, I do it. If it says not to do it, I don't do it. But it's not to say that this is the only way. So <laughs> this is one of my favorite like, philosophies, is that knowing you know nothing is way more powerful than thinking you already know something. All right, Every day I'm wanting to learn more, and there's always something changing at Amazon. And as soon as you get complacent and think you know something, Amazon's going to change it up on you, and they're, you're gonna, they're going to drown you. So just always have the approach that every single day when you wake up, there's going to be something new to learn and something that you can do for your business that you weren't doing before. So finding product ideas is the easy part. There are so many ways to get product ideas. So whether you're using software that lets you scrape into uh, like a black box tool or you're looking at Etsy for, for trends, or you're looking at Google for trends, or you're asking friends and family, or you're just going to stores and seeing what's for sale, you're just browsing different websites, you're always going to be able to come up with ideas. The key is just to figure out what niche you might want to go into. And I like to use a methodology where I think about who my audience is. When you understand who your audience is before you ch choose a product, then you understand the value that they are looking for, and you understand how to sell to them later. So you'll understand how to design your images and your content to speak to them. Why are they buying that product? So before you even think or find the product to validate, if you're thinking about who would buy that product, now you can start to think about all the things that person would buy. And that can give you a whole world of products to start validating and going through this process with. So we're going to go through a bunch of reasons products fail. And believe me, I've lived most of these. If anyone in here that has a bunch of active products on Amazon tells you that they've never failed, they're lying to you. Like, the key with all of the big sellers that I know, and there are multiple seven and eight figure sellers in here that I, that I recognize that I've known for many years, 
many of them still outside because they've heard me speak before and they don't need to hear me speak again. But all of us have failed. The reason that we do so well, the reason that we make millions of dollars on Amazon every year is because we never gave up. We learned from the failures. And <laughs> so I'm going to go through all the reasons things fail, and I'm going to try to help you learn from these failures that I've already had so you, maybe you don't have to go through them. So the first is that you choose an unpopular color or design. It's very easy with an amazing tool like PicFu. Raise your hands, guys. The two founders happen to be here. And sponsors of Wizard of <laughs> Ecom. Uh, it's very easy with an amazing tool like theirs to take your potential product design, put it next to several best sellers that are already on the market, and find out which one the, the audience wants. That helps you validate. Why go through the, the six months of developing a product, getting samples, putting it on a boat, designing packaging, getting it into Amazon, spending money for PPC, and then finding out no one's clicking on it, finding out no one's buying it. And the reason is not because you failed. It wasn't because you executed the launch wrong. It wasn't because you wrote the listing wrong. It was because you chose the wrong design. So it's very easy to do the validation up front. Don't fall in love with your own design, something that you like, just because you like it. Because you like it doesn't mean most people will like it. So think again about your audience and take your own ego out of it. Another reason is that you didn't have enough capital. Very, very, very common mistake that I see people make is that they find an amazing product, the data checks out, everything's great, but the reality is maybe that product takes $50,000 in capital to really get into and do right, and you had 15000 This is something that I'm going to that I show people how to calculate properly. You need to be thinking three orders in advance. You need to be thinking about cash flows. And one of the difficult parts about doing Amazon private label is that it is a, a lot of major college level classes and courses and degrees built into one. It is statistics, it's data, it's uh, finance, right? It's design, it's marketing. It's all of these things that you need to know at a very high level to be successful. And the best thing to do is just to take it one step at a time. But finance is going to be where you either make your money or you get killed. So don't get into a product without knowing exactly how many units you should be ordering and how much money you need for that next order and the next order. Because you'll have money coming in as it's selling but it won't be as fast as you're putting money out in the very beginning. So think always three orders in, a, in advance. All right, this is not enough keywords or root diversification. How many of you guys have seen like uh, what we call a master keyword list? There should not many, very many. I'm gonna, I think I have a screenshot here. The reality is there are many ways people search for products on Amazon. All right, there, I'll give you a great example. Uh, one is a toiletry bag. How many of you have heard of the term DOP kit? That's my point, all right? Many people throughout the United States call a toiletry bag a DOP kit. Many people call it a bathroom bag, a travel bag, right? There's all these different names for it, but it's the same product. That diversification of terms is why you can have an advantage as long as you understand how to do the keyword research. But if I wanted to sell a product that was only called by one term, very simple, anyone can guess it, I'm not playing to my strengths of doing good keyword research. I'm, I'm basically just throwing myself into a, a pit of everyone being able to compete against me. So I have a very short lifelong value on a product like that and it's going to be very difficult to compete, right? <laughs> the other thing that I want to look for are keyword, like uh, products that have a lot of keywords, not just a lot of different ways people are searching for them. That's going to allow me to use that advantage of finding all those keywords and ranking for all of those keywords rather than those only 10 to 20 that people search for. 
Another one is not enough aggregate search volume. You might find a great product, but maybe it doesn't really have the demand that you think it does. Maybe one keyword has a little bit of demand, but then the rest are very, very long tail, and it's a very slow moving product. So you spend a lot of time investing in building a product, developing it, designing it, getting it here, and it sells three units a day. And re the, that's just the reality of some products. They just don't have the demand. Product or keyword research will tell you what the true demand of a product is. And at the end of the day, everything comes down to two things in business, traffic and conversions. Too many sellers selling the same exact thing. We find this all the time where it's very easy to go on Alibaba or 1688 or AliExpress and find the same exact design that four or five or six other sellers are selling. Even if only two other sellers are selling the same thing and they're not as good at Amazon as you are, by the time yours gets here, there's gonna be four more. I can guarantee it. So spend the time to customize the design at least a little bit. Figure out a way to add value to the product so that it becomes unique and becomes your own. Poor quality control. I've been guilty of this many times, even when we thought we weren't. I would go to China and go into a showroom and have carts of toys uh, lined up that I spent hours walking through and picking out samples. And then it's, it's the coolest thing ever, it's so fun. You would sit in this room and I would be doing keyword research and my wife would be there trying to break every toy. Like literally just playing with it and seeing how good, how the quality of it, right? Then we would go through the trouble of choosing the product and find out that the, the factory changed the materials or the quality after the order. Or they're missing one part. We didn't quite do the quality control testing at the factory that we needed to. And then all of a sudden the product fails. And we have thousands of units that are really not going to sell because you have, you ordered 2,000 units for three months and now that's nine months of inventory, right? And you're lucky if you even sell it at all. So make sure that you go through several quality control checks and you, if you're questionable, if something is on the border of maybe it'll be good enough, don't do it. Make sure that it's good enough. Not enough profit per sale. This has become more and more important over the last year and a half. Amazon restricting our ability to put products into the warehouse uh, and ship products directly to Amazon has forced sellers to bounce their inventory off of third-party logistics companies. So we send a lot of inventory to these warehouses that we've partnered with, and this adds so much cost to the product that sometimes people aren't calculating that. For a long time, we saw sellers doing the same thing, selling at the same price, but we knew they were losing money, right? competitors that we had in the market where we were like, there's no way that this guy's still making money because they're, or they're making five cents a unit, right? Because think about it, your container arrives at a warehouse, you have to pay someone to unload that container, six, eight hundred dollars. You have to then pay them for every single pallet to palletize and you'll get 30 pallets, 40 pallets out of a container. Then they go and put it into shelves and charge you to store it and then when it's time to send it to Amazon finally, they charge you to pull it, label it, and then you have to pay for the truck to Amazon. All of that adds up. So know every single thing that you're paying for. It's not just the cost at the factory and what you're gonna sell it for at Amazon minus the fees. That's the mistake, that's the easy calculation a lot of people do in the napkin math to say this is a good product, I'm gonna make money. Make sure you're using a very detailed tool to finally check that product. Datadive has a calculator that's free with the Chrome extension called Profits. If you go to a product page, it's right above the buy box, and you can do, you, you insert all the numbers, and it'll tell you exactly what that profit is. Compliance issues. Now, if you're going to enter something like toys, or baby, or a consumable, or a topical, or something people put on them, clothing, I've named almost every product now, haven't I? Every product has its own compliance uh, restrictions. Every single product will have different certificates that you need to have and different testing you need to do. 
go into starting your business or go into every single product saying you know nothing, right? This is where we get in a mistake when we assume, we, like mistakes when we assume we know something. You know nothing. Start from there and do the research and find out what there is you need to do for that product. There is something, I guarantee it. Otherwise, your products can get seized at the port. Uh, Amazon will pull them and destroy them, and all of that money is gone. You don't want your business to be wiped out overnight. IP infringements, this is another major one. It's happened to us where we've, uh, we've, we've been selling a product and then a patent is granted afterwards, right? Whether it's a utility patent or design patent. So we get through an order, we place another large order, and then all of a sudden we're slammed by an IP uh, complaint. Some of them are not real. Some of them are bullshit, pardon my French. People will use these to attack you. Our SOP for dealing with an IP complaint is to immediately contact our attorney and have them do a check. Let us know the reality. I don't know as good as my attorney. This is why I pay him a lot of money. He will immediately tell me whether I actually am infringing or not. If I'm not infringing, then I will follow either what's called a DMCA notice, which will give the, uh, the complainant 10 days to file a real lawsuit or F off, or I will um, immediately start filing uh, responses with Amazon and have my attorney send a letter, FedEx, to Amazon Legal in Seattle. And within a few days, your product will be back, right? But it doesn't carry the same weight if you do that letter yourself. But this is where you need to weigh it as a business decision. How much inventory do you have? How much is it worth it for that product to be live? Was it already going well for you? If you're getting attacked, it usually is. So you have to think about how much am I, is it going to cost me? My attorney is $1,500 to $2,000 to write this letter and send it off and do this analysis, right? But that's $2,000. If I was making $200 a day profit, that's only 10 days of profit that, I'm, that, uh, you know, that it's costing me. So do the math and figure out whether it's worth it to fight it. But do it quickly. A lot of times on Amazon, you will get attacked. And if you don't know how to handle these attacks, you will keep getting attacked. It's like the bully that sees that you're easy to pick on. If you handle the complaints very quickly or you handle these issues, if they change something on your listing, if they file something, if you handle it quickly, they will stop picking on you because they know that you know what you're doing. So just understand how to counter these black hat tactics. All right, so let's get into some of the things that we look at. And when, data, when you're talking about data, it's very easy to look at causation correlation and to look at a few different points and think that you have all the picture. But the more data you have, the more complete picture you have. So the better it makes you. So we're going to give you a quantifiable way to do product validation. So these numbers are a little skewed, but I just want to give you an idea. If it's 25, it's a little important. If it's minus or plus 250, it's very important. So I just want to show you some of the things that would add value and explain about them a little bit. All but three competitors have bad images. This is good for you, but it, how good is it? Because it's not as good as you think because your competitors can get better and change their images very quickly. They can discover a great designer. They can start using PicFu, and they can start to compete with you very quickly. So this isn't going to be a long-term solution or something that's going to be a huge long-term advantage. It's going to be a short advantage, so it's worth a little bit. All but three competitors have bad reviews, and you can make a product comparably priced, but better quality. This is good. This is a very good one, 50 to 100 points. This is something that I would rely on on a regular basis. Here's one of the issues that I've had. I had a bubble maker, like one of our biggest brands is a toy, toy brand, and I'm in the showroom, and I see the exact, I'm holding the exact like crab, I think it was, it sticks on the bathtub or it has like the suction and it spins and makes bubbles and I'm like, this thing's amazing, it's cute. And then I look it up on Amazon, two and a half stars. There's like three sellers selling the same exact mold, two and a half stars. The factory contact information's there and we contact the factory and we're like, why, like we see it leaks, 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 everything leaks. And the factory tells us, no, this is the new design, it doesn't leak. So I pour some soap into it, immediately starts leaking all over the table. So 
you have to be sure that you do have a higher quality product. But if I were to have a good mold for that product, and I could maintain four or four and a half stars, and everyone else was at two and a half, I would crush that market. Because even the two and a half were selling like 50 units a day, right? So think about how to really take advantage. Something like that is worth spending the money on a mold and spending the money to invest in a product if you can truly make it higher quality. Current average, average selling price of the best sellers is at least 150% ROI. This is our, this is our like, floor for finding a product right now. Uh, because 150% ROI factoring in all those costs, we know is going to get smaller once we start selling it. You have to assume that prices are going to come down, that there's going to be costs you didn't factor, things are going to get more expensive, shipping could triple overnight like it did two years ago, right? Like, it, these are things that you have to factor. So if you start at 150% <coughs> ROI and it comes down, you'll still be okay, right? So don't start with a product that's 50 or 40% ROI and think you're doing okay. That will quickly go to zero or negative. Current average selling price of best sellers is at 250% ROI. Obviously, this is better and something that would be uh, a product that you would definitely want to do as long as these other negatives I'm going to show you aren't there, right? So it's 150 points. After looking at a competitor reviews, at competitor reviews, you find obvious and inexpensive product improvements. One of my favorite examples of us fixing a product um, that crushed it for us, we probably made six figures in profit, was the best, two best sellers just had, they didn't have great images, like the images were okay, but their images all made the product look a lot bigger than it actually is. And the biggest complaint that they had, the reason that they were three and a half stars, is because it's smaller than, it, than I thought. It's smaller than it appears. Too small, smaller than I thought, right? All of these one-star reviews that were coming in, all we had to do was do good content and really realistically show the size of the product and we would avoid all of those negatives. So all it is is better content and a realistic expectation to your buyers about the size of the product and all of a sudden we have a higher rated product. So think about an inexpensive way. Look at the reviews of your competitors. Another thing would be um, not coming with an accessory or not coming with enough of a disposable accessory, adding extra. Oh, it was great, but I went through it too quickly. I wish I had more of these, right? You just see little things like that in the Q&A and the reviews. You can quickly add value to the product with very little cost and, add, uh, and, and have a winner. So at least 50 keywords above 350 monthly search volume and 20% relevancy. This is what I'm talking about with the master keyword list. If you guys don't know, there's a free uh, workshop and masterclass on my website that you can go watch. It's three hours long and it's a very detailed dive into how we do data analysis and keyword research. So all you need to do is go to seller-systems.com and you can watch the free masterclass on how to do keyword research. What we're looking for is that once you take the top 15 to 20 best sellers and you take all of the ways each of them are getting their sales and you put it all together, you're gonna to come up with all the keywords that drive sales for a product. We're looking for at least 50 keywords with at least 350 search volume that are somewhat relevant. If we have that, then that's gonna indicate that it's a product that gives us enough of an advantage to rank for enough keywords. If there's 200 keywords, it's another 25 points. Probably another 50 or 75 points because you're at, you can add them together. The more keywords, the better because we're good at keywords. Play to your strengths. If you can find keywords and your competitors can't, this is how you beat them, right? So play to your strengths. So a nice distribution of search volume across eight root words. So this is when I'm going to go to the example of, um, man, I was doing one yesterday. All right, the famous garlic press. We were just, we, we've done this example a bunch. Everyone's used this for as long as I can remember in the space. Everyone's talked about the garlic press. Did you know it's also called a garlic masher, uh, a garlic crusher, a garlic mincer, right? All of these different ways people are calling this product, and OXO and KitchenAid 
the second and third best sellers of, the, of, a, of a garlic press on Amazon are not good at indexing for garlic mincer. They don't put mincer in the, anywhere in their listing. And all they would have to do to increase their revenue significantly, so if anyone here knows anyone that works for KitchenAid, send them my way. All they need to do is change their title and add garlic mincer, they would immediately increase their sales 10 to 30%. Significantly, right? But what we're looking for are these root words, these different ways people call products. If we have a lot of those, then that plays to our advantage. So in uh, three or less strong or very strong competitors, this is a huge one. This is why it's worth 200 points. If you look at the 15 best sellers and only three of them are on 80% or more of the search volume or 60% or more of the search volume of the keywords that drive sales, it's a wide open niche. It means that the majority of sellers selling that product are not good at Amazon. That's gonna be a very easy product to quickly become a top three seller. And that's gonna be a product that, you know, these, this is becoming more and more of a unicorn to find a product this easy. You're gonna find people in the you know, products that have like three to six sellers on a regular basis, four to six. That's gonna be a medium risk product that you can become a top five seller in very easily if you know what you're doing. But if there's only three strong sellers, you're, you're in really good shape. So again, we talked about five or less, seven or less. Um, a negative, what, which we're gonna get to, would be if like, you're looking at a product and out of the top 15 sellers, 10 of them are on most of the search volume, first page of most of the search volume. That's gonna be a very saturated product. There's not a lot of room to improve or beat them on keywords. Most of the time, those niches are very well developed with their content and with their value, and we'll get there. So with high confidence, you can get a utility patent. Do we happen to have an IP attorney in the room? Where did Rich go? Rich left? Uh, I, thought, I thought I was setting them, up, setting them up good there. Good job, Rich. <laughs> so you have to know the difference between a utility patent and a design patent, first of all. You can do a bunch of micro design patents to build a small moat around a niche because you can just file a bunch of Launch a product, the design's going well, file a design patent, keep doing that, file a bunch of variations. That's gonna build a little bit of a moat for you, but design patents are very easy to get around. We were selling a diaper bag, maybe, we haven't sold it in a few years, but when, early on we were selling a diaper bag and someone filed a complaint against us, and it wasn't our product. Our, their zipper was in a different place. That's all that matters, right? Like, all you have to do, one zipper being not here and over here instead, changed the entire design. So it literally like, got rid of their patent, and we were able to get it back selling, and there was nothing they could do about it. So don't waste money on design patents unless you're sure of your strategy of being able to protect very customized, clearly I, like, designs that people just love, and then file a bunch of smaller ones around similar designs so that you, you can kind of build a moat around it. Utility patents, though, are the holy grail. If you can manage to get a utility patent, which is about the functionality of the product, no one else can really enter that niche anymore. No one can sell a product that does the same thing your product does with the same functionality. Uh, and it could be something as simple as the placement of um, one, you know, your, your button does a certain thing in a certain way, right? No one else can build a product with that button that does a certain thing in a certain way anymore. So if a competitor comes in and they bribe the factory to make some of yours out the back door and they show up on Amazon, it's immediately gone, right? So that's going to be the biggest moat for you and the most valuable is that, is that utility patent. That's why it's worth 250. So with high confidence, you can get a design patent. Again, that's only worth 50 points because of the fact that it's easy to get around. Increasing search volume on Google Trends. Whenever you're gonna get into a product, you need to understand whether it's a fad, whether it's trending up, trending down, or it's seasonal, all right? Those are like the four main things to look at. Fad, trending up, trending down, or seasonal. Things tend to become more or less popular over time. Fads will go up and down very quickly. Don't enter a fad like a fidget spinner on the way up thinking that you're gonna make money forever. It's not gonna keep going up like this, right? It's gonna come back down and crash. Funny enough, fidget toys and fidget keywords have maintained to be a thing, but it's becoming 
just bundling as many fidget things together, and now you're, you got 12 things, and the last competitor had 10, and the next guy's gonna have 15, and the next guy, and everyone's making less money, right? So then you're just chasing the fad at that point, and it's not gonna be a long-term strategy for winning or, or having a valuable business. Trending up and trending down on Google Trends will be very clear. Coming in and out of COVID, baby category is very, very good for this because we saw a baby boom. Everyone that was locked in their house for the lockdown, a lot of people had babies. That there was nothing else to do, right? So the baby market went way up. A lot of people waited to get married until things opened up last year. So now we have another baby boom because now people got married and now they're having their kids. Another baby boom, but it'll trend back down. So be aware of when your products will, will land. Seasonality is very clear. Is it a summer product, a winter product? Is it a giftable item? Is it a gift for mom? You got two spikes. You got Mother's Day and you got, you got Christmas and the holidays. You got Q4. So you have to always be thinking about when will my product land? Always be thinking six months in advance. When will my product land and is it near that season? This will help you order enough inventory. And you can look at charts from, uh, from Keepa. Keepa is a great resource for looking at uh, historical BSRs or ratings on Amazon. So you can see how fast and, uh, your competitors are selling during certain times. So less than three major brands sold in brick and mortar with a lot of branded search on Amazon. Most of the time, I don't necessarily fear a big brand for the same reason I just gave you the example of KitchenAid. I still don't want to go sell a garlic press. There's still 10 or 12 very strong competitors selling gar garlic presses. And even though these guys are not doing a good job at some of these other keywords, if someone finds my product next to KitchenAid's and it's Brandon's garlic press, which one are they going to buy at the same price? KitchenAid. So if they're going to be on the majority of the big keywords, but they're missing out on all the long tails, and they've got the name brand, it's going to be tough to beat them. And you're not going to beat them on their, their branded keywords, right? No, if someone searches for Lego, I guarantee you they're searching for, for Lego bricks, not Brandon's bricks, right? So just be aware that if there are four, five, or six major brands on the first, in the top of the first page for most of the keywords, that's going to be a product that's very difficult to break into with a <coughs> private label brand. So the price point is below $10, minus 50 points. Let's get into some of the negatives. I know a lot of big sellers that make a lot of money selling cheap products. Their businesses are running th on thin margins. It is very, very hard. It is a fast-paced business. It is very, very uh, easy to go from making a dollar on a product or two dollars to not making anything or losing money on a product. A product that was great for them for years is now maybe costing them money every single time it sells. I avoid products under $10. Now, that's just my philosophy, and this goes back to saying that you know, many people do it many different ways, but a product under $10, you can't really pay someone to click on an ad for you if that ad costs you $1.50, right? So think about like your inability to do advertising and rank the product to try to break into the market, how expensive that's gonna be, and for how little reward. That's just part of it, right? So I just avoid these cheaper products. If it's below $15, I'm still avoiding it. It's still a negative, but it's only negative 25. It's not a deal breaker. And as a matter of fact, minus $10, I probably should put minus 100 or minus 150, simply because like, I want it to be more of a deal breaker. Now, eight or more strong or very strong competitors, this is what we were talking about. If the majority of those top 10, top 15 sellers are ranked for most of the keywords on the first page, that drive sales for that product, it's pretty saturated. You have to have a real advantage to beat them, which goes back to the other advantages that we were talking about. So it's only minus 75. If you can overcome that with the other positives, unique product design, something like PickFu, like 90% of the audience at PickFu loves your design over the best sellers, you can still enter that market and crush them. But just don't, um, you know, just understand that what you're getting into is you're fighting for a top four, like fourth, fifth, sixth versus first or second. And that's true with most cases. I can tell you that some products are dominated by, uh, by a best seller who's ranked for a ton of generic keywords that you can't expect to also duplicate. Be realistic when you're doing your keyword research. Are you really going to rank to the top of 
toys for four-year-old girls when you launch your new toy. No, like you just, you have to back that out and expect not to duplicate the same success as that guy that managed to land that. If you're launching a baby toy, do you think you're gonna be able to launch to the top 10 ranking of baby toys keyword, which has 80,000 search volume a month or something? No, you can't do that. But it, so if you're analyzing competitors and the best seller is three times the sales as everyone else, that's the reason. He has all those other generic keywords that we call outlier keywords that he's able to take advantage of that you won't be able to take advantage of. So that can help you paint the complete picture and answer the most important question that we're always trying to answer. How are my competitors getting their sales? If you can answer the question, how are my competitors getting their sales, then you can understand, can I also duplicate that success? Can I do it better, right? Or am I going up against a, a monster that I'm not going to be able to beat? That's going to help you paint a realistic picture. So we got uh, maybe one more page. I know it's, we're, we're dragging on here, guys. I wanted to woke you up in a minute. Let's stand up again. Let's, let's take uh, 10 more seconds. Get the blood flowing again. We're going to do some Q&A after this. I know it's a long day. You too, old man. <laughs> Good to see you, bro. How you doing? Good. All right, go ahead. Stretch. All right, let's sit back down. All right. Now, on the previous page, previous page we had eight or strong competitors, uh, minus 75, 11 or more. This is a majorly saturated product, should be a deal breaker, minus 250, so it's really, really important. ROI below 100%, remember now we're starting to get into the danger zone where margin compression can quickly make this product not profitable, minus 50. It's not a deal breaker. A lot of times very expensive and big products, you're making less than 100% ROI. Remember that every single time you sell your product, 100% ROI means that you can buy two new units with it. Sell one, buy two, that's 100% ROI. If you're not able to do that every single time, you can't com ca uh, compound your capital. You can't grow your business. The higher the ROI, this is why I value ROI over margin. Margin is dealing with the selling price and your profit. This is dealing with your actual return on your investment. So how many times can I turn that capital over every single year, or every single year and then how much am I getting back every single time I make a sale? So less than $5 profit per uh, sale. Minus 50 points. Remember, $5 can disappear really quickly if you, have to bounce, if you were planning on sending it directly to Amazon and now you gotta go to that 3PL, right? Immediately, that's gonna cost you a couple dollars a unit a lot of times. And then you have shipping costs. You, you, were, you were planning on a you know, $6,000 container, now it's 26,000. Now that product's losing you money, right? You gotta factor in and look for products that are making more than $5 per sale. And that's net. Decreasing search volume. So if the trends on the product are downward, you're, 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 you got a market that you're entering in that's going down, that's gonna be minus 50 points. It's not a deal breaker, it could still be a big market, but be more realistic as to where that market's gonna be in six months, if those trends continue. Competitors have great images and content, minus 50 points. Doesn't mean you can't do better. It just means that it's already a sophisticated uh, niche. It means that they've already gone through it and they've got great designs gonna be harder to stand out, but not impossible. Minus 50 points. At least three of the best selling competitors are bundling the main item with accessories. This is minus 100, but usually this is a deal breaker for me. What happens on Amazon is that one guy's, like I gave you the example with the fidget toys. One guy's selling 10, the next guy sells 12, this guy sells 15. Those are all just little toys. But a big example is like the, uh, the exercise bands. You got one guy that was doing really good selling two exercise bands. Another guy sold four. And then another guy sold six and threw in like a towel. And then another guy threw in a, an inflatable ball with it. And then another guy threw in an ebook. And another guy threw in something else. So you look at the first page of exercise bands. You don't see exercise bands anymore. You see all these bundles. And it's not the same product anymore. It's all these bundles of value. That means that that niche is so far sophisticated and, and blown up that it's probably not worth entering because you've lost any advantage you would have by selling the same product. You don't even know what to sell anymore at that point, right? At least um, four of the top 10 best selling competitors have over a thousand reviews. Look, I say four of the top 10 best selling because if, if I look at the top 10 or top 15 sellers 
and there are there are sellers who are not very strong on the keywords that have a lot of reviews, I usually don't care. I don't care about how many reviews. They could have 20,000 reviews, but if they're only on 30% of the search volume, I'm going to crush them on the other 70% where they're not even going to show up. So don't yeah, don't don't get scared by reviews unless they are on 100% of the keywords and in the top few spots, right? So just see if there's still an advantage for you. At least six of them, so that would be minus 50, at least six of them have 1,000 reviews and minus 100 becomes more of a deal breaker. You can add those together, minus 150. You're almost not going to do that product. Two or more of the top 15 best sellers selling the same exact design that you want to sell. Remember, this, is, uh, this should be minus like 50 or 100 points. Like, if you're going to sell the same exact design as two of the top 15 best sellers, by the time yours lands and gets there, you're going to have five competitors selling the same thing. You need to create an advantage. Don't do that product. Change it at least. Uh, five or more of the top 15 best sellers selling the same exact mold design. That's a deal breaker, minus 200 points. Less than 25 keywords with 350 monthly search volume. So very few keywords. Remember, that goes back to our advantage of finding keywords and understanding how to look at the data. Don't do a product that very few people are like, searching different ways for. There's no point in doing that product if you're good at keyword research. And all of you should be, right? It, it's, it's, it's out there. It's a free class on it. Go, go take the free class. Don't do products that have very few keywords. Four uh, of the root words or phrases make up the majority of the search volume. I'd say two. If, if you got two or three keywords that are literal uh, root words that make up all of the search volume. So if, if garlic press was only called a garlic press or a garlic mincer and crusher and all the other ones didn't exist, I probably, even though I don't want to do that product anyway, I probably still, I wouldn't do that product. Because I want diversification. I want to have my advantage of finding the different ways people are calling a product. Minus 100 points. If only two is minus 250. So four or more of the major brands or Amazon brands in the top 15. Again, this is minus 25. Again, I don't necessarily, it's not a, it's not a huge one and not a deal breaker. I don't mind competing against those major brands. All right. We got a uh, code for uh, the inner circle. I have a mastermind uh, and a full college level course, 180 hours of content, 1,100 members, over 300 seven and eight figure sellers. It's very collaborative. Uh, we teach an abundance mentality. And uh, you know, you're, you're welcome to join us if you're serious about your business. You could save $1,000. It makes it $2,000 for the first year and $1,000 per year after that. And, uh, or you can just join Datadive. Datadive is going to be the tool to do all of that research that we just talked about in a matter of minutes per product versus hours, right? It's a very fast tool. Uh, you can find information about it. Anthony is here uh, with us, and he's, uh, <laughs> uh, he's, he's been with the team. But uh, thank you very much. <laughs>